morning to each and every one uh, that's listening on today, and I want to wish everyone a happy Resurrection Day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm glad today because of what Jesus did on Calvary and what he's doing in our lives even now. I have a card I'm going to uh, read uh, this morning. Um, he had the power to come down from the cross. He chose to stay for you and me. Isn't it great to know how special we are to Jesus? Blessings at Easter and always. This comes from Brother Nathan and Sister Doris Rue. God bless you, Brother and Sister Rue, um, for that beautiful card. Let us pray uh, this morning. Lord God, we come in the name of Jesus, and we are thankful today for this special day. We're thankful for all that you have done in our lives, the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, the grace that you have so meticulously put upon each and every one of your children. Lord, we thank you for your mercy because you have been and you are a merciful God. On this special day, Lord Jesus, we know that the grave could not hold you down, but that you rose with all power, both in heaven and on earth, in your hands. We thank you today for living in our hearts and living in our souls. We thank you for our homes and for our families. Though what we're going through right now seems like a great tragedy, and for many it is, but Lord, you are still blessing us. You have blessed us to give you praise. You have blessed us to, for us to be able to say thank you, Master, for all that you are doing. Create within us a clean heart and help us to remember what you did for us on Calvary, and how early on the third day you rose with all power, both in heaven and on earth, in your hands. Keep us near the cross, because at the foot of the cross all of the ground is level. For whosoever will, let them come. We open up our hearts and we receive your word today, gracious Master. Speak to our minds, speak to our hearts, speak to us, Lord God, like only you can speak. Bless us like only you can bless us and keep us as only you can keep us. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Have thine own way, we pray this day in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and our Redeemer. Amen. We're grateful and we are thankful to God today to to be able to come as a witness of what Christ has done in our lives, a witness to the fact that he is alive and that his mercy endureth forever. We want to talk to you for a little while and we want to encourage you in the Lord with the word of God. I know that many of you who are listening right now, you feel kind of, down, you feel kind of out of it because normally we would be in service together on one accord on this special day. But today is another day. This year is another year and things have changed. But Jesus is still the same. And that's what we have to focus on and we have to remember that Jesus Christ, the same today, tomorrow, and forevermore. I want to talk to you this morning for a little while and use as our subject today the sweetest name I know. The sweetest name I know. Second Corinthians, the second chapter, and I'm going to be reading out of the Living Bible on, on today. And a couple of several scriptures from Second Corinthians, second chapter beginning at the 14th verse. The scripture reads, But thanks be to God, 
for through what Christ has done, he has triumphed over us so that now wherever we go, he uses us to tell others about the Lord and to spread the gospel like a sweet perfume. As far as God is concerned, there is a sweet, wholesome fragrance in our lives. It is the fragrance of Christ within us, an aroma to both the saved and the unsaved all around us. To those who are not being saved, we seem a fearful smell of death and doom, while to those who know Christ, we are a life-given perfume. Today we celebrate a great victory. Matter of fact, it is the greatest victory of all time. Now, the question arises, how do you celebrate a great victory? For most of us, you don't have to tell us how to celebrate a great victory. It just comes natural. But how do we celebrate a great victory? Well, at the end of World War II, for example, the nation celebrated with tanks and marching soldiers that paraded down the streets of New York City to the shouts of celebrating uh, spectators. They were looking on. They were celebrating the end of World War II. At the end of the annual Olympic Games, the medalists, they parade around the arena to the thunderous applause of each country's onlookers. When a particular country is portrayed, the onlookers are shouting and they are clapping. And you'll agree that with me that victory is sweet. And I think we can all agree on that, that victory is sweet. But victory is sweet not only to us, but victory is sweet for God also. God revels in the victory of every soul saved from destruction. God revels in that time when we come to him, when we give our lives to him when we are saved from destruction. The echo of our confessions of are faith, sweet, sweet sound in his ear. The apostle Paul has this awesome victory in mind when he writes this letter to the Corinthian converts. He said, I imagine as a Roman citizen, he looks and he envisions this victory that we're talking about, a Roman triumph with captives that are marching behind their victors with one exception. Unlike the Roman spoils of war, these captives are certain of their fate. For Paul writes in the King James translation, he says, thanks be unto God which always leadeth us to triumph in Christ. Christ is always leading us forward to a victory. One victory here, another victory there. But Paul tells us that we are his co-workers in Christ. Rather than being bound in jail and by our captor, Christ, we are set free to go and spread the good news of our captive experience, to tell someone that I was once shackled and bound by sin, but Jesus captured me and he set me free. For we are now, as Christians, those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, for we are now the sweet perfume of his offer of salvation. This offer is for every one. This offer is not for some and not for others, but Christ offers salvation to each and every one of us. Whosoever will, let him come. 
That's what we celebrate today. We celebrate as conquered captives, savoring the knowledge of redemption through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And longing to pass on, we cannot keep it to ourselves, but we are longing to pass on the sweetness of our victory through our singular expression of faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says here, he says, our heart's flame sends out a fragrant, sweet odor to those who would be saved and a repugnant smell to those who reject salvation. You know how it is. We as Christians, our lives are a sweet order. We go around those that don't want to know anything about Christ, and when they see us coming, we are a repugnant smell to them. For the first things they are saying is that, oh, look at those Christians. Look at them. They think they're this. They think they're that. So we don't smell sweet to them because they will not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. But Paul's letter to the Corinthians reads like an autobiography. He says, I was an enemy of Christ, and now, he says, I am conquered. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And the question might be begged uh, to be answered, what kind of an enemy was he? Well, by Paul's account, he had lived a pure life. And you listen to the ordinary person that doesn't know Christ. I live a good life. My life is good. And just like Paul, Paul's account of his life was that he was pure. Paul says he was virtuous and, and a respectable life that he was living until his Damascus encounter with Christ. The Roman law had considered him obedient. The Roman law had considered him blameless. He observed all the rules. He observed the regulations as a good citizen. He was sober. He was temperate. He was unsullied. In other words, he was spotless, uh, no one could bring charges against him for any infractions or anything that he had done. And if they did bring infractions to him, then he was certain that he would be acquitted. And yet, as he looks back over his life and he thinks things over, and that's something that each and every one of us must do. We must look back over our lives. We must look back and see where we have come from. We must look back over our lives and see the goodness of the Lord, see what the Lord has done in our lives, and see how gracious and how kind the Lord has been to us. And if we would truly be honest about it. We can look back over our lives and we can think things over and realize that we missed out on a whole lot of things because we were separated from Christ. He realizes that he was the enemy and this is what we have to realize. It wasn't Christ, Christ but we were our own worst enemy. How could such a law-abiding person be an enemy? Well, because with all of Paul's virtues, uh, his life was void. He was missing the deepest faith and the purest love that only Christ could offer. You can search here. You can look there. You can turn around here, you can turn there, but you will always have a void in your life if you don't have Christ in your life. His life was void. His life was not 
what it should have been, and life will not be what it should be until we come in contact with Christ. And, and, and here's a familiar expression. There, but for the grace of God, there, but for the grace of God, go I. This could be our autobiography. For we too were once enemies of Christ. Each and every one of us at some time in our lives, we were enemies but like of Christ. Paul, we were good, respectable people, trying our best to live decent lives. Uh, uh, some people were saying, well, I'm not like those over there. They gamble, they drink, and they, they do this and they do that. Well, regardless to what anybody else does that's apart from Christ, whatever it is, maybe you didn't drink, maybe you didn't do this, and maybe you didn't do that, but you did something because the Word of God teaches us that we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe your lifestyle was, was decent. Maybe your lifestyle was what it, you thought it should be. But did it live up to the lifestyle that Christ was looking for from us? We were still enemies of Christ. But, but, but Christ did something. He, 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 he broke us. Uh, 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 he he, he he challenged us and he captured us. He captured our hearts and we were overcome by the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God. He is our Prince of Peace. We are conquered by a captor whose only weapon is a cross. And oh, what a weapon, a cross that exposes our need for salvation. The cross offered genuine, uh, genuine love to Paul and to all who desire it. You have to want Christ for yourself. You have to want him as your Lord. You have to want him as your personal Savior. And if you want to know how far this love will go, study the cross. In the cross, there are some things that we seek. At the cross, we see how much Christ cares. He could have come down, but he stayed on the cross for your sins and for mine. He cares for you. He cares for me. In the cross, we see how committed Christ is. Uh, Christ is not just looking for Christians, but He's looking for committed Christians. He's not looking for sometimey Christians, but he's looking for every time Christians. He's looking for someone that doesn't love him part time, but loves him all the time, that are willing to do his will. Whatever he wants us to do, we have to be willing to do it because Christ was committed, we must be committed also. Then in the cross, we see something else. We see how costly is his love. It costs him. Love has a price, and it cost him a trip to Calvary. But now, he did not stay on Calvary. It was not for him to stay on Calvary, but it was meant for him to rise early as he did on that third day morning, with all power in his hands. And how far will this love go to save us? His love went all the way. We are here uh, 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 as willing captives, uh, 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 thankful for Christ's Calvary sacrifice. We are here, why? Because God has made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There ought to be a hallelujah out there somewhere 
Hallelujah for Calvary's confirmation of Christ. Hallelujah for Christ's expression of unfathomable love. Hallelujah for Christ's expression of unfailing forgiveness. Hallelujah for Christ's expression of unending grace. Paul's letter to the Corinthians gives specific instructions to the captains. And that's something that we have to be mindful of. As captives of, of Christ, he gives instructions. We must pay attention to the instructions that Christ has given unto us. He instructs us for a reason. He instructs us to be obedient to every word that he says unto us and everything that he wants us to do. When he instructs us to love ye one another, he's not just saying words, but he means for us to love one another. Even those that despitefully use us, this love has to be unconditional, just as his love was unconditional. So he gives specific instructions to the captives. That's us. We get to take part in the triumph of our captor. He is the conqueror of death, hell, and the grave. How we participate in his victory is up to us. We can join his conquering army, or we can remain the conquered enemy. It's up to us. Either way, we are still his captives. It's a choice that we all have to make. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, we can remain conquered foes of Christ, or we can become his conquering allies. Paul spells it out quite graphically. He says that those who continue to fight against their captor will smell of death and doom, while those who join Christ's army will be a life-giving perfume. We have a choice. We can stink or we can be a sweet saver. It's our choice. It's up to us. Sinners think that they are free. They think that they have the power to call their own shots and make their own decisions. And, and they are partly right. They are partly right. They can reject Christ. Anyone can reject Christ, but he's still the judge of their character. Yes, they can refuse Christ. Anyone can refuse Christ, refuse to accept him as Lord and Savior of their lives. That's your choice, but he's still the judge of humanity. They can rebuff Christ, push him aside, but he's still the judge of where they will spend eternity. The choice is ours. Only Christ, I'll say it again, only Christ can remove the stench of our pathetically poor and sinful lives and deliver us from evil. He is a strong deliverer. Put your trust in the Lord and watch him deliver you from evil. Watch him snatch you away from Satan. Watch him take you out of your valleys and place you on your mountaintops. He is a strong deliverer. That's what we as the captives of Christ celebrate today. We celebrate the hope that we have in him. I have hope in Jesus Christ. We celebrate the comfort that we find in him. I find comfort in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We celebrate the power we have in him. He gave us power to resist the devil. We celebrate the wisdom that we find in him because all knowledge and all wisdom comes from above. Paul's letter to the Corinthians describes our new life in Christ. 
But oh, isn't it good to know that we have a new life in Christ, that our old life is behind us and our new life in Christ is with us. Who would have thought being conquered could be so sweet? Whoever thought that being a, 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 a captured by Christ could be so beautiful? Whoever thought that by being captured by Christ we would have so much joy, joy unspeakable. It is the greatest of victories. Sin has been conquered once and for all. It is the highest of accomplishments. Mankind has been offered unending redemption. It is the finest of ours. Our victor has risen from the dead. It is the surest of all moments. Our Christ lives. He lives in us and he lives through us. Oh, hallelujah. There have been other victories, but none so great as this. Yes, there have been other victories around the world and in this world, but none as great as the victory that Jesus has over the grave. Greece had its thermo poly, but Christ's victory is greater. Napoleon had his Waterloo, but Christ's victory is greater. England had its Battle of Hastings, but Christ's victory is greater. Our revolution had its Battle of Yorktown, town, but Christ's victory is greater. The Union Army had its Gettysburg, but Christ's victory is greater. World War II had its Hiroshima, but Christ's victory is greater. Christ is greater than all the peace pacts devised by mankind. For those who have joined the army of the Lord, hallelujah, there will always be enemies. Don't, 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 don't think that for a moment that because you're in the army of the Lord that you won't have enemies. Christ had his enemies and you're going to have your enemies also. You're going to have those that can't stand you, those that don't like you for any reason, those that don't want to be around you for whatever reason those that say things about you for whatever reason, our enemies will come across our path. There will always be enemies to face. You may have to face an enemy called illness. There's a lot of illness in our world right now. People are sick and People are losing their lives. But I stop by to tell you, Christ is greater than illness. You may have to face an enemy called homelessness. Many people are losing their jobs right now, cannot afford to live in a home, and perhaps will be homeless. But I got good news for you. Christ is greater than homelessness. You may have to face an enemy called racism. Who would ever think that racism would, would even raise its ugly head in times like these, but racism is still alive and well. But I got good news for you. Christ is greater than racism. You have to face, you may have to face an enemy called indifference, but Christ is greater. You may have to face an enemy called COVID-19, but Christ is greater. Christ is greater than all the devilish schemes Satan can devise. He's greater than any weapons formed against him. He's even greater than your foolish pride. Paul says, those who become crisis, conquering allies, 
will be a sweet savor for the world around us. And certainly the world needs Christ right now. And the sweetest savor to the Lord. We have overcome. We are forgiven. We are renewed. We are restored. And we are blessed. Yes, Christ, his is the sweetest name I know. No other name has done a greater work than Christ. No other name has offered a greater sacrifice than Christ. No other name has expressed a greater love than Christ. No other name has shown greater mercy than Christ. No other name has paid a greater price than Christ. And according to John's account, Mary Madeline comes to Jesus' tomb early on Sunday morning and finds that the stone had been rolled away. She runs to tell the disciples that the body of her Lord had been taken away. Peter and John examine the empty tomb and go away to digest what has happened. But Mary lingers, so she stays weeping, she loves Jesus so much. Her heart is broken, and even the angels at the tomb cannot console her. When Jesus appears before Mary, before her in the garden, she mistakes him for the gardener. But then he speaks her name, Mary. Oh, isn't it good to know that he knew her name, and he knows our name. When he calls our names, we have to answer his call. He knows my name, and he knows your name. And if you're listening today on this Resurrection Sunday, you've not yet submitted to Christ, won't you confess him right now? as Lord and Savior of your life, and join the army of conquered Christians and serve your Christ. He knows your name, and you know his name. It is the sweetest name that you will ever know. Somebody called him early this morning. He heard your cry and answered your call. We called him sometimes at noonday, and yet the Lord also comes to our rescue. Sometimes late at night, when everybody's sleeping, we can call the name of Jesus, and he will hear and answer our call. Yes, his name is the sweetest name on earth. Thank you, Jesus for your resurrection. Thank you, Master, for boring our sins on a hill called Calvary. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to our rescue when we were perishing, when we were going down for the last time. You came by and rescued us. The sweetest name on earth is the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to our help and to our rescue. Uh, thank you, Master, that when uh, we call your name, uh, you hear our call uh, and you come uh, and see about us. Uh, somebody's calling you right now. Come uh, and see about me. Uh, I'm helpless right now. I'm afraid uh, for my life right now. I'm afraid of COVID-19 right now, but Jesus is our answer. He's the solution to our problems. Call that name, and I guarantee he'll come by and see about you. Call that name, for at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of lords 
and he is king of kings. The sweetest name I know. What about you? Somebody out there right now, you need Jesus. Somebody out there right now, you've been putting it off for far too long. You know what you need. You know how far you have drifted away from Christ. You know how far you are right now. And the only thing that's going to bridge that gap between you and Christ is you. You have to call his name. You have to confess him as Lord and Savior of your life. And watch how fast that bridge is gapped. Watch how quickly you will be restored. Watch how fast Christ will instantly come into your life, faster than the blinking of an eye. But it's up to you. It's up to you to want to be saved. It's up to you to want to call on that name of Jesus. This is a resurrection day he rose early that third day morning. The stone was rolled away. The grave clothes were placed neatly in the tomb. But Jesus is not there, for there are no bones in that tomb. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you today and we confess that we are weak, but thou art strong. We confess, Lord, that many have strayed away from you. Lord, we pray that thou will bring them back into the fold. Touch their hearts today, Lord Jesus. Touch their minds today and let them know that they need a Savior. But the only Savior that will save their souls, his name is Jesus. Touch their hearts today, Lord Jesus. Touch this country today that we will not depend on the doctors for a solution, not depend upon our president for a solution, not depend on Congress or the Senate, nor the stimulus money that's being sent out right now. For well, that will only last for a little while. But Jesus, you last forever because you are from everlasting to everlasting. We ask your blessings today upon all of those that are bereaved this day. We ask your blessings upon Brother Hector's family, Lord Jesus, during their time of bereavement. Bless them and secure their faith. Gracious Master, that they will look to you, that you will strengthen them at this time. Strengthen their hearts, strengthen their minds. Help them to look to you for guidance and for strength, not only today, but each and every day. Bless and keep each and every one of us, gracious Master, as we stand firm on our faith and our convictions that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Lord, we thank you today for your resurrection, for the power that you have, for you have all power, both in heaven and on earth. Thank you for coming forth out of that grave. Thank you for uh, coming forth into our lives and resurrecting us, resurrecting our dead souls. Thank you, Master. All praises to thee we give, not only now, but always and forever. This is your servant's prayer. I pray in the perfect name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer. God bless.